Anderson, how goes the battle in the subcommittee? Uh, I've just heard something that disturbs me, Mr. President. Sit down, please. Thank you. It's a uh, rumor at the moment, and it may not come up. But for your own sake, as well as Mr. Brandeis, I urge you to be as candid with me as possible. And take it easy, George. You look pale. Well, I don't like being a lawyer to clients who may not have given me all the facts. <laughs> well, this client will. What is it? This is a very difficult question to ask, Mr. President. Uh, have you ever known a woman named Mrs. Peck? Oh, yes, of course I have. She was a friend of the first Mrs. Wilson. Did you ever give her any money? I didn't give her money in the sense that I made her a gift of it. She had some properties in New York whose mortgages I bought up. She needed the money because her son was gravely ill. Was Mr. Brandeis the lawyer who acted for you in that matter? Mr. Brandeis? No, of course he wasn't. What is this, Anderson? Well, the rumor as I have heard it, Mr. President, and you must forgive me for repeating it, is that you and Mrs. Peck had an illicit liaison. That you wrote her some letters. That she threatened you with a breach of promise suit if you did not agree to marry her. That the price for calling off this threatened suit was the amount of $75,000. That Mr. Brandeis was the person who acted for you in that matter. And that this is the reason you have nominated him to be a justice on the Supreme Court bench. Mr. President, there is enough truth in this rumor concerning you and Mrs. Peck to make it seem credible. Credible to whom? Mr. President, if you did give... Not gave. Loan. And certainly not in consideration of dissuading her from threatening me with a breach of promise suit. The whole rumor is disgusting and baseless. But there was a financial arrangement between you and Mrs. Peck, sir. And Mr. Brandeis was not the attorney? No, of course he was not. And Mr. Anderson... The amount of money involved was $7,500, not $75,000. And the money was given in exchange for two parcels of real estate in the Bronx, and not for any bundle of love letters. Mr. President, I didn't know this had happened. Well, why should you have? It was a purely personal matter. Mrs. Peck needed money. She had the security for it. I loaned it to her and held the security. Mr. President, this story can be most damaging. A lie like that? It is well known that the truth never catches up with a lie. Mr. President, I urge you most earnestly, under these extraordinary conditions, to let me ask Mr. Brandeis to withdraw his name. I wouldn't dream of it. I'm surprised you'd even suggest it, Gregory. And now let's talk about the real problem, which is, how are we going to get the votes of these three Democratic senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee? Now, it's my idea that the best man to get to Lee Overman would be Josephus Daniels. Daniels knows Senator Overman very well, and he's a persuasive man. Don't you agree, Gregory? Yes, sir. Joe Daniels would be fine. Why does he not see the danger? Do you know what they're beginning to call the president? Peck's bad boy. George, I want you to go to Boston and see Brandeis. Now tell him what the rumor is. Tell him what the risk is to the president. And get him to withdraw his own name. being spread all over Washington. Does the president know the story, Mr. Anderson? Yes, sir, he does. I told him myself. And what did he say it was? To use his exact words, arrant nonsense. Then, sir, I will merely add it is malicious nonsense. I didn't come to you because I believed it, Mr. Brandeis. The president doesn't realize how dangerous malice can be. The Attorney General and I agree that it could be fatal to the President and to his campaign for re-election in November. We don't feel that it will impair your own chances for the seat on the court. But the President's chances in November could be hurt. This is still a Puritan country, Mr. Brandeis. You don't have to remind me of that, Mr. Anderson. Not in Massachusetts. All right, then. 
We will be faced with the prospect of a lot of desperate men who are convinced they can find enough Puritans who will believe a maliciously dirty tale about the President of the United States. And on the basis of this danger, what is it you wish me to do? Shall I come out publicly and deny this story? Oh, no, Mr. Brandeis, please don't do that. We don't want to give this story any more currency than it has. Then what do you propose I should do about it? Mr. Gregory and I felt that you might uh, withdraw your name. Mr. Anderson, if I thought that by withdrawing my name, I could spare the president any embarrassment in connection with this falsehood about Mrs. Peck, I would do so instantly. But the withdrawal of my name will not stop the spread of this poison, will it? Well, perhaps not, but... And in fact, by withdrawing my name, it might add to an otherwise unconvincing tale. Don't you think? I have not considered that prospect, sir. Then I suggest you do, Mr. Anderson. Woodrow Wilson is a fighter, and so am I. And before you ask two fighters to surrender, you'd better come up with a more frightening danger than this. If the president asks me to withdraw, I will do so at once. But until you bring me his message that he is disposed in that direction, or until you bring me some evidence that I am obliged to accept as a deterrent, I am in this fight to the end. On May 20th, 1916, President Wilson was aboard a train for Charlotte, North Carolina. On the same train was Wilson's friend, Josephus Daniels, assigned to talk to Lee Overman, a crucial member of the Senate committee, voting on the Brandeis appointment. Will you do me a favor? Lee, I will if I can. I hope you know that. Well, this train's going to make a stop in Salisbury tomorrow morning. I want you to see Wilson. Ask him to come out there on the platform and make a, a brief speech to the people of Salisbury. Well, go on in his compartment and ask him yourself, Lee. After all, you are a United States senator. And this is your state we're traveling through. Yeah, I did ask him, Joe. It seems he's saving his voice for that big meeting in Charlotte tomorrow evening. Oh? Well, I guess the president knows what's best for himself. Joe, Salisbury is my hometown. Now, if I can't get Wilson to make a speech in my own hometown, how's that gonna look for me? They may get the notion you don't rate very high with the president. Joe, you know that's not so. Of course not, Lee. Why, Wilson said himself, I have no better friend in the United States Senate than my good friend from North Carolina, Lee Oakland. Then he will speak, Joe. Well, I'll ask him. But when you ask favors of the president, you got to be prepared to give favors. Well, what favor could I possibly give him? Well, Lee, I think you you put your mind on it very hard. You might come up with an answer. Just what would please the president. I told Senator Overman that I was loaded with only one cartridge this morning, <laughs> which was to be exploded at Charlotte. <laughs> but I am very glad indeed to give you my cordial greetings. And to say how happy I am to find myself in Senator Overman's hometown. You have reason to be proud of your senator. And I am very glad indeed to give him the tribute of my praises. And if he will allow me to add it, of my friendship. Thank you, Mr. President. One down and three to go. Shortly after Wilson's return from Charlotte, the second crucial member committee... Senator James O'Gorman paid a surprise call to the White House office. Good evening, Senator Somebody. O'Gorman. I've got to see the president, Mr. Matter of Life and Death. He and Mrs. Wilson are at the theater, Senator. The British are going to execute an American citizen. Can you imagine the gall of the British? I tell you, Tumulty, if we can't get the president to act tonight, they'll murder him. Well, can you help me out with a few details first, Senator? An American citizen. Fully naturalized, mind you. 
Caught, innocently caught, in the uprising in Dublin is going to be executed by the British tonight at midnight. I tell you, Joel, that every Irish American society is up in arms and I don't blame them. You and I and everyone knows the long history of the Irish struggle for independence. Everyone knows the long and bloody record of British rule in Ireland. Everyone knows that... None better than I. My name's Tumulty, as you may have forgotten in the heat of the moment. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. You're a good Irishman, Joe. I tell you, the president has got to intervene. It's a matter of common humanity. A matter of defense of American rights. The rights of liberty. Well, I'm sure the president will act the moment I tell him what's at stake. A human life is at stake. Uh, so is your political life in New York, Senator. Isn't it? This man who saves the life of a, an Irish American snatches him out from, from under the British executioner's axe. Well, he'd, uh, he'd be quite a hero among his constituents, wouldn't he? Tom Hardy, you've got something in your mind. Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking of you, Senator. The, the, the man who saves the life of... Uh, the, the, What's his name? Lynch. Jeremiah C. Lynch. Man who saved the life of Jeremiah C. Lynch. Oh, that uh, U.S. Senator obtained stay of execution for, for Irish-American patriot. British court foiled. Oh, the, the, that'll look grand in the papers. It'll look grand. Now, uh, well, wouldn't you like to delight and please the president, Senator? What? Well, I mean, if you, if, you can, if you consider that he's going to do you and uh, Jeremiah C. Lynch such a great favor. I mean, saving Mr. Lynch's life and uh, putting a little life into your political career. What do you want, Tumulty? I don't, I don't, I don't want anything. I don't want anything. But uh, I know the, the president wants to see Louis Brandeis on the Supreme Court. I understand. Yes, well, why don't, why don't you sit, sit right here and I'm off to see the president right now. You... you uh, you did want me to go right to him, Senator O'Gorman, didn't you? All right, go ahead. And, Tumulty, you might hurry. The man's another Irishman, you know. One man held a deciding vote in the Senate committee. Senator Shields of Tennessee. Senator Shields is here, Mr. President. Oh. Ask him to come in, please. It's good of you to come to see me tonight, Senator. I appreciate it. You tell me that you're at a dinner party. Yes, Mr. President, but it's always a pleasure to be called to the White House. Sit down, please, Senator. I've been intending to ask you to the White House for some time now, but there's been great pressures on me. I understand. Great pressures. You know, this war in Europe is very serious. Tell me, Senator, what is the sentiment in Tennessee about this war in Europe? Well, sir, the sentiment in Tennessee is to keep hands off. Oh, I see. Next time, you may be able to bring Mrs. Shields with you. Oh, we'd like that. We'd like that. Well, Senator Shields went out of here with a cigar in his face and then grinned from ear to ear. Did you offer him meat and potatoes? Great platters full. Didn't exactly gobble them down, but didn't refuse them either. When is the committee voting on his recommendation to the Senate? Charlie McCauley said they may get to it May 23rd or 24th. May 3rd or 24th. The four monk hearings. And if John Shields doesn't vote for his appointment, the whole thing can go down the drain. It's an odd country we have. A red-eyed drinking politician from Tennessee can keep a man like Louis Brandeis off the Supreme Court. There's no guarantee that Henry Cabot Lodge won't invoke senatorial courtesy when it comes up to the Senate. 
I'll bet you ten dollars he will. I hope Lodge does. I'll run him out of the Senate and so far back into Back Bay, he'll never be heard of again. by the seat vacated by the late Joseph Ricker Lamar. You will indicate by a vote of aye that you recommend that appointment and conversely nay that you disapprove. The clerk will now call the roll. Senator William E. Bora. Nay. Senator Charles A. Culberson. senatorial courtesy? You did. Oh, thank you. I wonder why he didn't. Just one of those uh, New England mysteries. Like clam chowder. On Monday, June 5th, 
1916. Louis Dembitz Brandeis appeared for the first time on the bench of the United States Supreme Court as an associate justice. The record of his service in that court is public and distinguished, bearing out every hope that his friends and supporters expressed throughout the long fight to confirm his appointment. The hero of Justice Brandeis' elevation to that bench was the 28th President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson who had risked his career, his administration, and his re-election, first to summon forward a great jurist, and then to support him when every force, friendly and hostile, was bent on making Wilson retreat. Woodrow Wilson's refusal to retreat was an act for which every American, every person who loves justice, may be proud. These stories of past courage can teach they can offer hope, and they can provide inspiration. But they cannot supply courage itself. For this, each man must look into his own soul.